Mantle Ministries presents Richard Little Bear Wheeler. Come join Little Bear in true adventures of the past and discover biblical principles that can change your life. Well, how would you like to have this for dinner? Nice, baked, crushed, and boiled acorns. Well, that was pretty common fare for the Indian of the New England periods of time in our history, and we're studying about the Indians in these series, and I hope you're enjoying them. There's a lot we can do and benefit from the Indians, and I think they're a very fascinating and somewhat enjoyable subject to study. However, the subject that I'm going to cover in this segment is not very enjoyable, but yet I think as we study the Bible and its uh, relationship to the story, we're going to find it very heartwarming and knowing that we have a God that comforts and uh, protects those that are held in captivity. We're going to talk about a woman by the name of Mary Rawlinson, and it's called The Captive. Uh, she was the first woman that uh, wrote a book in America. Her story dates back to about 16... Uh, 75. Let me tell you the story, and uh, we're going to do this somewhat in story fashion, and Little Bear is going to tell you a story about uh, what happened to Mary Rawlinson. Uh, before telling you the story, let me proceed the story with a little information and background history that I think you'll find uh, interesting. Now, when the pilgrims came over to America in 1620, uh, they came in the latter part of the year, December, so immediately within a month, it was uh, 1621, they, uh, by that following spring, had met the band of Indians that would be most familiar to them and within their immediate confines. Those Indians were called the Wampanoags. Uh, as you know the story briefly, and when we cover the Pilgrim Puritan history, we'll get a little bit more specific. So I'm just giving you a background sketch of understanding English and Indian relationships in this particular segment that we're covering now and in the captivity story. So what happened was uh, Squanto, who was a Patsuk, uh, he came to the village, was bilingual, and he came and was the interpreter of the Wampanoag and Chief Massasoit and the pilgrims. And so together with the aid of uh, Samoset and uh, Squanto, known as Tusquantum is his real Indian name, but they call him Squanto for short, uh, they began to parley and eventually drew up a peace treaty together. And that peace treaty was to last them for over uh, 50 years. And it was good, held in repute by both the English and the, the Wampanoag tribe. The basic tenet of the treaty was that if any Indian tribe should attack the Wampanoags, the English were to come to their assistance and defend the tribe from other warlike tribes. I think I should clarify also something here in case you haven't seen some of the other Indian segments that we've been covering. You must keep in mind it wasn't always just the white men that came and brought barbarities to the Indians. The Indians themselves brought barbarities to one another. You would oftentimes have enemy warlike tribes uh, fighting one another. And had the white men never come to this nation, uh, you would see in the future generations, had we discovered it much, much later, traces of, of, of complete Indian races being obliterated, men, women, and children, by other Indian tribes. And so the Wampanoags saw the assistance that they could have from the English because they brought firearms, they brought power, and, uh, and with that asset, they would be a great strength, an ally. So the Wampanoags made allies with the, the pilgrim Indians that we're most familiar with. And they kept their word for those 50 years. However, Massasoit, of course, died, and his first-born uh, son, his eldest son, he uh, took the, uh, the, the tribe, but he didn't live much longer after his father died, so he uh, died the second chief. And then his third son, the next one, was called Philip. That is his Christian name. And uh, what happened is the pilgrims had had great influence upon uh, Massasoit, and they have, of course, we know the very famous Thanksgiving, and, and uh, they had relationships like that with these Wampanoag Indians, and so they were friendly with one another. And in that friendliness, more than likely, there was some, what we would call in modern days, conversions, where the uh, Indians would have had some dealings with the Christian faith of these pilgrims. This Christian faith was most important to the pilgrims because Bradford himself said in his journal, and I memorized the quote, it said that we have come here for the propagation 
and the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yea, but that we would be but stepping stones in the performance of so great a work so that others would come and basically, Bradford's saying, build on the foundation that we've laid, the foundation of Jesus Christ. And so the pilgrims saw themselves as, as messengers of Jesus Christ, not only to the uttermost parts of the earth, but they, like uh, Eliot, the missionary to the Indians, and, and Wycliffe, excuse me, Whitfield, uh, the uh, missionary to the Indians, they worked extensively uh, going in the backwood trails, risking their life to convert these Indians. And many of the Indians became converted. I'm going to tell you about one specific one. His Christian name was John Sassamon. And uh, John Sassamon was a Wampanoag Indian. He belonged to the uh, tribe of the Wampanoags where Chief Philip, Massasoit's third son, was now in command. However, Philip he ended up becoming dissatisfied with the English. Let me tell you why. And now I'll give you an Indian perspective so that you'll understand what's going on in the Indian thinking. See, the Indians, of course, lived here for many years, and even though they have uh, hatred towards one another and many of the tribes and there's warfare with one another, they had to add to that complication English coming. Well, it's as if things aren't bad enough already with other Indians trying to take their land. Now you have the uh, white men coming in to try to take their land. Not all of them were peaceful, like uh, William Penn. Not all of them were like uh, Roger Williams, who was trying to work with the Indians. Some of the white men were just uh, out-and-out scoundrels and would steal the land from the Indians or do terrible things like uh, introduce them to alcohol, get them drunk, and then take the land through uh, an alcoholic uh, deception. So there's all kinds of things going on like that. Well, Philip, knowing that and, and not keeping the faith of his father, as far as we know, Philip never made a profession of faith. And so he, had, he was on the outs uh, with the English because many of the Indians were taught the Puritan pilgrim ways. They had to go under English law. And it wasn't the Puritans that were willing to bend. They were expecting the Indians to bend towards their form. In other words, they had to keep the Sabbath. They had to uh, not th uh, have th thievery. They had to be honest. And uh, if there was any uh, bad dealings with the English, they had to go to an Englishman's trial. And the trials were fair because there are times that the English tried uh, white men for things that they were doing to the Indians, and the white men were uh, tried, oftentimes ex executed, where execution uh, uh, merited uh, because of maybe murder, maybe a white man murdering an Indian. Of course, they used the Old Testament for law. You take a life, your life shall be required. Now, in this story, John Sassamon, uh, this praying Indian is what the English called them as they made a confession of faith. They were called praying Indians. And so John Sassamon would go in and out of the, uh, the, tr the village of the pilgrims. And he really was a kind Indian. The pilgrims enjoyed him and liked his fellowship. And he would come to the saints' church on the Sabbath and worship with them. It happened to be that John Sassamon would go back and forth with, Mas with uh, Philip, the Massasoit Indian, and uh, go back and forth, uh, well, actually he's Wampanoag Indian, but he's Massasoit's son, and go back and forth. And so it happened that Philip didn't like him, and Philip began to uh, resent him, uh, being friends with the English and living in his tribe. Well, to make the story a little shorter, they ended up killing John Sassamon, but they made it look like he'd, he'd fallen into a pond and had frozen himself over. So they, they, they left him floating in the water, and uh, as the ice iced over the pond, they, they uh, left his rifle on the top of the ice so it would look like he was uh, fallen in the water. The ice crept in, he drowned, and there was his musket. Obviously, he wasn't killed by the Indians because who in the right mind would kill a man and, and leave his musket? So he must have died an accidental death because the musket's laying there by his body. But it happened as when the, when the ice thawed out that they, they looked at his body upon his inspection and found that he had had some head wound, a severe head wound, a wound to his head, and so it was concluded that he was killed. Obviously, who did the killing? They were not exactly sure, but they suspected it was more than likely another Indian. And as they began to investigate, they found three Indians that uh, were accused because there was an eyewitness who had seen this. And so they brought the eyewitness to account. The eyewitness uh, named the three Indians, and the three Indians were brought to trial. They were found guilty, and they were to be hung. They hung all three Indians. All of them said, we didn't do it, we didn't do it. They denied the whole entire thing. And lo and behold, they hung them all. They fell through the scaffold with a rope around their neck, and uh, they died except for one. When the rope fell down through the scaffold, it broke and he fell to the ground. 
the Indian seeing this uh, panicked and uh, he realized that maybe uh, he should make right a story. So he told the truth upon the breaking of the rope, admitted to the fact that yes, that these three had been involved by Philip's decree to kill John Sassamon, this Christian Indian, and that he was heartily sorry for his deeds. And uh, who knows if he made some kind of re uh, a penitent faith, a prayer, uh, but nevertheless, being true to their word, they had to go through with the sentence. They re-strung the rope, tied him up, and he died. And so they then, uh, Philip, found out about this and resented that the white men would have a nerve to do this, and they ended up uh, uh, doing war against the colonists. Now I'm telling you, we're taking you to about the year of uh, 1675. We're looking about the year of uh, uh, January of 1675. Now Philip begins to uh, gather Indians from all about, the Nagarancits, uh, himself, the Wampanoags, and uh, uh, the Pequot, I believe it was the Pequot. So all three tribes uh, began to do war against the English. Now, not all the Indians were against the English. We know for sure the Mohicans didn't enjoy the uh, Wampanoags, and they didn't like the uh, Pequot, so they began to do war against them. And please forgive me if I get some of the tribal names mixed up. But uh, what I want to say here is three tribes went with Chief Philip, and three large tribes stayed with the English. And oftentimes those three other tribes would help the English and uh, tell them and help to avert them from a sneak attack by another tribe that was their enemy, warlike uh, tribe that they didn't enjoy. I hope I'm making sense to you. So what happened was this. The Indians came in around January of uh, 1675, and they uh, attacked a town by the name of, see, see, the town was called uh, C Swansea, Swansea, Massachusetts. And uh, they attacked the town, got them totally by surprise, and killed men, women, and children. And so the uh, Indians that were uh, kind, the praying Indians to the English, found out that they were on the war path and they were going to go to a town called Lancaster, Massachusetts. Well, at that town, it happened to be that they went to warn the town, but also Mary Rawlinson, the, the, the whole focal point of this, this session that I'm doing with you, Mary Rawlinson's husband, John Rawlinson, was a pastor, and he fled the city, and he went to Boston, and he went to go get some assistance to go help uh, against this attack because the, the city of Lancaster, the, the, the community of Lancaster was very small and they couldn't withstand several uh, hundreds of Indians attacking them. So while he was gone, another praying Indian went all the way to Concord, Massachusetts, the very Concord that we have today in Massachusetts, and there uh, begged the English to quickly gather uh, uh, an army because he knew very quickly the Indians had already left the wilderness and were heading for Lancaster, so it was a, a, a race to the end. They both began to run as quick as they could, and it was unfortunate for the English because they didn't arrive in time. Now, what I like to do is, uh, in story fashion, because I love storytelling, so I'm going to read to you just like a mom would read to you, and I'm going to read to you a very beginning chapter of the book by Mary Rawlinson. I have the book available if you're interested in reading the full account. It's very fascinating, and, and uh, at the end of these segments, you'll have uh, availability for writing me, and I'll get this book in your hands, Lord willing. It's an old book. It's been reprinted, and so hopefully it will still be available when you write. And let me read it story fashion. And, and, and maybe we'll even put some sound effects in it and such. I'm not sure if we will or not, but that's my intentions. But let me here read to you. On the 10th of February of 1675 came the Indians with great number upon Lancaster. Their first coming was about sun rising, and hearing the noise of guns, as we looked out, several houses were already burning, and smoke was ascending to heaven. Now, Mary Rawlinson is giving her narrative. This, you might say, was her own words written in America, and she was the first woman to publish a book in America, and it immediately became a great success for Mary. Fortunately, she needed it for the income because the Indians had wiped out everything that she had owned. There were five persons taken in one house, the father, the mother, and a nursing child. They were knocked on the head with tomahawks, and others, too, they took and carried away alive. Let me make an aside here. 
What the Indians would often do is take you captive, kidnap you, and use you as a hostage so that they could end up bartering for you later and making money off of you and selling you back and, and then therefore uh, earning money and not only killing but earning money on those that they took captive. There were two others who, being out of their house or out of the garrison, the garrison is their, you might say, their fortification. Think of a Davy Crockett kind of fort at Disneyland where you have those palisades, those walls. Uh, being outside of those walls, uh, for some occasion, were set upon by the Indians. One was immediately tomahawked on the head. The other escaped. Another there was who was running along the garrison trying to get in was shot and wounded. He fell down. He began to beg for his life, promising them money, as, as uh, it was told later. The Indians are telling this account to Mary later on, so she's getting a very accurate account here, as they told me later. But they wouldn't listen to him. They knocked him on the head, and they stripped him uh, naked and split open his bowels. Mary's language here is this godly woman is very descriptive, very heart-wrenching, and very tragic. Uh, they, 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 they split his head open with a tomahawk. They, they probably, by the 16, at this time, this would be 1675 or uh, early 1676, they had steel tomahawks, or they may have still used stone, but they were lethal weapons. Right here I have with me, I must well show you uh, to break up the story a bit. I have a, an old uh, flint stone that was given to me here as I, I, I film here in Texas. I live here in, in the area. And uh, you can see it is, is shaped somewhat like, a, like it could be an ax. Believe me, this is very lethal, very uh, sharp. And I could see very easily a stick being attached to this head, lashed about like my fingers would be, the handle coming down, and then using that. And that could, that could do some uh, uh, serious damage to you. I have with me, and I, I'll try to uh, take this out, I have with me a modern, uh, what we call a white man tomahawk. Of course, it's steel. And uh, the Indians would have uh, loved something like this, a steel tomahawk. Uh, of course, it doesn't break, doesn't chip. And so the steel tomahawk gives great advantage for warfare. And of course, the white men like these things because they could chop wood, build houses, and do things that they would have to do with their axes. And so this gives you a little idea of the weaponry that was involved there. Now let me pick up the narrative for you again. They were knocked on the head. He was begging for his life, but they wouldn't listen. Another seeing many of the Indians about his barn, he came out and wondered what was going on. He was quickly shot down. There were others belonging to the same garrison. Uh, uh, let's call the garrison the city of Lancaster for words uh, uh, that you would understand. Belonging to the city of Lancaster who were killed. The Indians were climbing up onto roofs and barns, having an advantage by height and shooting down upon them over the fortification. Thus, these murderous wretches went on burning and destroying before them. At length, they came and beset our very house. This is the house where Mary is in. And quickly, it was the dolefulest day that my eyes had ever saw. The house, my house, stood on the edge of a hill. Some of the Indians got behind the hill, and others climbed onto our barn. Others were behind things that would shelter them uh, and protect them, because we're shooting back through our slits in our windows. We're shooting at the Indians to protecting us, and they're protecting themselves behind these things. They, they began to shoot and shelter themselves so that the bullets were flying in both directions like hail. And quickly they wounded one man among us. The blood is flying through the wood. Now, I don't know how thick these houses are, but they're certainly thin enough where they're causing bullets to fly through and hurting people standing within the house. One wounded one man among us, and then a, a second, and then a third. About two hours, according to my uh, observation, this went on. So imagine two hours of heavy fighting. Imagine the inside of the house, how it would be so full of black powdered smoke. In some of these episodes, we'll even shoot a musket so that you'll get a demonstration of what it's like and make this teaching experience a little more real to you. They had been there in the house. Uh, 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 we had been in the house about two hours before they finally prevailed to fire upon it. Fire, not fire with bullets, but fire upon it with flames of fire. So they began to fire upon it. They used uh, flax and hemp and brought it out of the barn. And, and they, we, there being no defense about the house, there was only two flankers on opposite corners. So they had two guys on opposite corners outside defending the house, but it was too late. They finished them off, and as they shot them down, they began to fire the house. 
It was dreadful. It was this most doleful hour. I've heard of this happening in times of war in the case of others, but now it has come to my own house and my own eyes have seen what I've heard in other times by other settlers. Some in our house were fighting for their lives. They were wallowing in their blood. The house was on fire. It was, the roof was burning over our heads, and the bloody Indian heathen were outside ready to knock us on the head if we came out of the house. Now might we hear mothers and children crying out for themselves and one for another, Lord, what shall we do? The mothers were crying out, Lord, what shall we do? I took my children and one of my sisters who was in the same house with me. We went to run forth from the house, but as soon as we opened the door, up Indians appeared and the shot was so thick and heavy that we shut the door and ran back in. It was as they took, they took a handful of stones and threw them against the house and the pallets uh, hitting the house was lead ball. That's how thick the lead was flying. We had six stout dogs in our garrison. And these dogs were so ferocious, they normally would leap upon an Indian at any one time and rip them pieces. But the dogs must have sensed that they were outnumbered in the danger, so the dogs that normally would leap upon, I memorized basically the story, stayed within the house. We thought it was most peculiar that the dogs would stay in the house. It was as if the Lord was going to teach us something. The Lord thereby would make us more acknowledge His hand and to see our help is always in Him. Don't depend on dogs. We had to learn to depend on the Lord. But we must go out. The fire was so increasing, it was consuming the house, we had to flee. The Indians were gaping before us, and the roaring fire was behind us. There were spears, guns, and hatchets to devour us. No sooner that we were out of the house that my brother-in-law, who was wounded in defending the house, fell with a bullet shot near his throat. He was dead. Whereupon the Indians scornfully shouted and hallooed, and they presented themselves, stripping off his clothes. The bullets were flying thick. One of them hit my side, and it would be as if it came through my stomach on the inside. And since I was carrying my dear child in my arm, the child's name was Sarah, my dear child Sarah in my arm, a little girl of six and a half years of age, the bullet came out into my arm, through my hand, and into the bowel of my dear child. One of my eldest sister's children was named William. He had his leg broken. He's trying to run, he falls and breaks his leg. The Indians perceiving that his leg was broken, he wouldn't be good for selling. They like to sell their children. Oftentimes if they didn't sell them, they would raise them to be Indians among the village and keep them there. Seeing that his leg was broken, the merciless Indians came and they knocked him, tomahawked him on the head. Thus we were butchered by those merciless heathens, standing amazed with blood running down our heels. My oldest sister, she was still in the house. And seeing how the woeful sights were about her, she stayed and would not come out. The infidels hailing mothers, they were pulling them one way and pulling them another way and taking their children one way and taking their children another way. My oldest sister's son ran up to her mother and said, Mother, William has been killed by the Indians. Can you imagine the lamentable mother? Here she's terrified and she finds that her son has been killed by these Indians. He's dead. And, and I myself am wounded. She said, I'm even wounded by the same Indians. She said, Lord, let me die among them. This mother's heart was not to face the situation. She cried out, oh, God, please take me. And immediately, no sooner was she said that, that she was struck by a bullet and she fell down dead. She fell dead over the threshold. I hope she is reaping the fruit of her good labor. She was a faithful Christian. And in her younger years, she gave her heart to the Lord, and she had a precious scripture to her heart, which is 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And it says, And he said unto me, the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for thee. For more than 20 years, I have heard her tell how sweet and comfortable was that place to her, the place that she realized that the Lord was gracious unto her. No matter what would happen, she would trust in the Lord. She died. Uh, uh, living that trust, commending her heart to the Lord. She died on the threshold, as I described. We must come along. The Indian says, come with us. Go, you go, or we kill you. We began to run with the Indians. Uh, they, they pushed us and moved us about. Oh, it was the most doleful sight that now beheld my house. It was in flames. The flames were all about us. Behold, the work of the Lord, what desolation he has made upon the earth. Thirty-seven persons 
who were in this house, none of them escaped present death, or at least if they didn't die, they were taken into captivity. There was only one who escaped, who might say as in Job 115. Now you remember the story of Job. It so gives her such comfort. In Job 115, it tells us in Job 115 that these Indians, uh, um, as they were coming and took them captive and destroyed them and took everything that they had, she relates it to the story of Job. And she says uh, that as Job was in the field, remember where the, the one runner runs up to Job and says, I'm the only one that escaped? You can't believe the story, Job. You've lost your family. You've lost your home. You've lost your possessions. So what I really so value about the Mary Rawlinson story is here's a woman who's faced with calamity, but you know what she does? She turns to God's Word, and that Word becomes a lamp unto her feet and a light unto her path. Her entire story is a narrative how God doesn't take you from the trial, but He takes you through the trial. Unfortunately, we live in a nation in America where sometimes it seems like we want everything to be hunky-dory, everything's going to be really nice, and we're not going to, uh, we kind of expect a nice, normal, everyday, fun-loving, easy-going Christian life. Unfortunately, when you read history, and that's why I think history is so valuable, you see other perspectives, and Mary understood that perspective. She was like Job in Job 115, and I want to read a passage out of Job that will help you to understand what's going on here. But let me finish this chapter. And I am only escaped to tell the news. There were 12 killed, some shot, some stabbed, some were speared, some were hit with tomahawks and hatchets. The, uh, when we are in prosperity, oh, the little that we think of such dreadful sights. In other words, when things are going well, who would ever think such a thing like this would happen? And to see and hear our dear friends and relatives laying, bleeding to death, their heart pouring their blood on the ground, there was one who was chopped on the head by a hatchet and stripped naked, and yet he was crawling up and down, still wounded. I mean, in this terrible condition, he was still alive. It was so solemn to see, and so many Christians laying in their blood, some here and some there. It was like a company of sheep torn by wolves. They were all stripped naked by the company of hellhounds, roaring, singing, and ranting, and insulting, as, as if we were torn out by our very hearts. And look at this Christian testimony. And yet the Lord by His mighty, mighty power preserved a number of us from death. For there were 24 of us taken alive and brought into captivity. I had often before said that if Indians should come, I should choose rather to be killed by them than to be taken alive. But now when my trial has come upon me, my mind has changed and though she used to say, man, when she heard stories about Indian captivity, she says, as far as I'm concerned, they could kill me, like her sister said. But now she says, you know what? I'm alive, and I, I just didn't want to be killed. I was gone with them. She said, I went rather along with them, and as I must say, with these ravenous bears, that then that moment to end my days would have been so much better, but yet I ended up going. And that uh, I shall declare in this story, in this narrative, what particular things the Lord has done as we began to remove up and down the wilderness. And the way she divides this book is she has what's called removals. There are 20 removals where she is uh, taken from uh, 20 different uh, locations, and she gives the narratives of her removals. And I would like to tell you some of her removals if you be patient, because you will learn some valuable biblical concepts that happens in her removals. A fascinating story. I told you I would read out of Job chapter 1, and what I want to do, this book is so valuable because really, with the Bible, this is a, a, a biblical thesis or a biblical teaching on how the Bible will help you uh, through trial and error and through the difficulties in your life. In Job chapter 1, it says, And there was a day when uh, Job's sons and daughters were eating. This is chapter 1, verses 13 and following. And they were having wine in their house. And a messenger came to Job, and I just told you what he said. Told about all the different things. How he lost their hands and how the Chaldeans came. A foreign power came and stole everything that Job had. Job rose and he tore this mantle. He shaved his head. He fell down to the ground and he worshiped. And he said, listen to the testimony of Job. Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked I shall return. Mary Rawlinson quotes this very passage. We'll find out as the story develops 
how she knows so much of this. First of all, she knows her Bible well. It's an encouragement for us to study God's Word. I came naked, and I will return naked. The Lord has given, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, in verse 22, in all this Job sinned not, no charge God with folly. It's important that we remember during difficult times in our life not to blame God for disparity, things that happen that's so terrible. Let's re look at some of the narrative situations. I jotted down some of the key points so I would keep my focal point. She leaves on her second night as she leaves out. Oh, by the way, as she left her house, she went into the woods and she saw a cabin and she said to the Indians, can I spend the night there? Because I'm wounded. My baby son is wounded. My, excuse me, my baby daughter, Sarah, is wounded and, and we want a place to stay. The Indians laughed at her. She says, oh, and so you want Englishman's way. You will no longer have Englishman's way. You will have only Indian's way. And these Indians were educated. They could speak the English language because of having barter trade with the Indians for at least 50 years. Some of these Indians were still old, and they remember the pilgrims coming. And their fathers taught them English. And so they drug her through the wilderness. They took her. And by the morning when she woke up, she says she is so stiff, she can hardly move. First of all, she's still wounded. One, in her, one bullet went through her side, went through her stomach, went through her hand. So she has a wound in her stomach, wound in her hand, and her baby's wound, wounded. And the baby is crying all along. So the Indians have enough mercy, and they're so fickle when you see the story. Sometimes they help you, and sometimes they don't help you. They put her on a horse, but it's bareback. Now, again, I'll break up the narrative, because I know it can get kind of long and tedious. And, and the Indians, some of the Indians in the Great Plains and in other uh, tribal areas had saddles. And I brought one with me. I think you might be interested. This is from a, a friend that I've become uh, acquainted with here in Texas area. His name is... Um, uh, uh, Mr. Wall, Ralph Wall, he's a Western Indian artist, painter. He does some tremendous, uh, beautiful in Western art. You might have some of his paintings. If you're interested in Western art, let me know, and I'll, I'll give you Mr. Wall's uh, a phone number so you can uh, talk to him about that. But he was kind enough to give me some of the artifacts. He uses, he uses some of this when he does his artwork. And uh, this is a saddle, and he was telling me that this is a saddle that uh, was used by females. Of course, you can tell it's, it's quite narrow here, and uh, it's very hard. This, uh, what you're looking at, I know it's hard to tell, but what you're looking at is a form of leather, and it's called rawhide. It's called rawhide because it's raw, it has not been tanned, and it's stiff as a board. It's very sturdy, and rawhide will outlast leather. Normally, leather that's been tanned, like this leather, is quite soft, see, and it's very pliable, but it will wear out sooner than rawhide will, and rawhide lasts a long time. So they put Mary Rawlinson not on a saddle like this that would keep her steady on the horse. They put her in bareback, okay? So you get an idea of some, some of the Indian culture here, and I, I think it's fascinating adding a few things like this that you might find interesting. And so they took her on the saddle. They began to take her and her child, but they went down such a steep hill as they were going that they both fell head over heels of this horse. And when the Indians saw her rolling about the ground, they rolled over laughing. They thought it was the funniest thing. Can you imagine being wounded and they're laughing at you? I mean, there's no mercy there for their, cap their captives. She's not the only one. There's others round about her. And there's several Indians in this big band as they're, they're taking her forward. Now, she calls these removals. On her third removal, she gives narrative in her book, called a captive. She takes, in her third removal, she hasn't had food for four days. She hasn't had water for three days. And they're not even giving her hardly anything to supply her and her baby's want. Meanwhile, her baby is saying, Mother, I'm in such pain. Mother, help me. Could you imagine the lamentable feeling a mother feels to see her daughter saying over and over how painful she is, and yet there's no way to comfort that baby. They, uh, they are so hurt and so wounded, but God is so merciful in the midst of captivity. There is a man by the name of uh, Mr. Robert Popper. Mr. Robert Popper was also captured by the Indians, and he came into uh, her, her uh, encampment that night. He was with another, uh, you might say, wigwam down the, down the area where they were kind of camped together, and he finding out where she was, he came up to talk to her, being English, wanting to speak to an Englishman. And so uh, he speaks to this woman and begins to tell her there's a medicine that he discovered using oak leaves. If you press these oak leaves on the wound, they will heal you. Well, she thought that was really neat. And so she took the oak leaves, as you said, and she ground them up and she put them on the wound of her child and on her wound. And the wonderful thing is she gives testimony in Psalm 38, 5. She says, my wounds stinketh. She's quoting from King David's psalm. And she said, yet God had mercy, and she uses the idea that although her wounds stinked, the Lord had mercy and healed her of those stinking wounds. 
her dial, her child ends up dying. It's so sad. It's February 18th, nine days after captivity. The child suffered all night long, and she took the child, if I remember right, outside of the wigwam because the people in the wigwam, their shelters, that in one of these earlier segments, if you get it, it's on Indian teepees and wigwams. I'll explain about that there. She took, they took the child out of the wigwam and said, well, I don't want you around here with that child moaning, groaning, and crying all day. It makes, us, it makes us upset and sick to hear this. So she ends up going outside in this cold, imagine back east, and you're looking at early February. And they're out there in this cold weather, and the child just dies. So the mother is so lamentable. She doesn't know what to do. And the Indians, seeing the condition of her face, realize the child dies. So they go take the child and uh, bury it while she goes in to talk to her master. What she calls her master is the Indian that took her captivity. At this particular place, the Indians, they go and they uh, uh, raid Medfield. At Medfield, they wipe out the entire city. Remember, this is a massive attack led by Chief Philip himself. These, these Indians that went alongside, I mean, this is no small thing. This is major. I'm talking about entire cities of, of uh, as much as 30, sometimes 50 uh, inhabitants being wiped out. What I call a city is really a settlement because that's all they were in those early days. And so they went to Medfield, wiped them all out, and it's just God in his mercy. Remember I told you earlier I would tell you about Mary Rawlinson and how she's coming up with all these scriptures? Well, one of the Indians came into Mary and had a book in his hand and came up with uh, his book and he threw the book down at Mary's uh, uh, lap and she looked at it. It was the Holy Bible. And he said, do you want this thing? And she said, oh, yes. And she loved it. God brought her in captivity his word. It's like the story of Corey Tim Boone. She says, oh, Lord, let us keep this word in this prison, how she was able to keep, keep the Bible and go into, into uh, captivity with God's word. I don't know of anything so comforting than God's word in captivity. I pray I'd never have to be in a state like that. I pray you would never have to be in a state like that. But I tell you, if I ever had to be, God, God forbid, but I would have his word. And if we can't have his word, you can see why it's so important to diligently keep God's word in your heart now. Uh, we have available, if you're interested, I think it may be about the, uh, sooner or later, uh, Darlene Rose's life story and how she was in captivity. And you know what she said when she was in captivity during the Japanese occupation of New Guinea? She said that the Word of God came to her mind. She had hid it in her heart since she was nine years old. So let that be a lesson to you young people. Your mom and dad can tell you to memorize scriptures. They can encourage you to memorize scriptures. But you need to apply the Word of God in your own life. We can't make you do it. It's so frustrating for us as parents. You need to word, hide God's Word in your heart. You'll never know. It will never return void. And to Mary, it came alive to her. Thank God she had the Word. And she also memorized much of the Word. She was able to relate the Word to her life. On her fourth removal, now sometimes the removals would be overnight. Other times it would be maybe two or three days in one spot. Why are they moving all the time? Well, what would you do if you just took about uh, uh, 20 or so captives? And you know the English are hot on your tail. You have to move. On her fourth removal, she ends up setting camp, and she meets a woman by the name of Mrs. Joslyn. She knows Mrs. Joslyn. Mrs. Joslyn and her are friends. They were Christians from their former community. Mrs. Joslyn is so upset. She says, I've got to get out of here. I'm so upset. She says, you can't get out of here. You run through the woods. You'll end up never making it. So she, she comforts Mrs. Joslyn with what? The Word of God. They turn to, and they read out of Jeremiah 31, 16. Let me turn to Jeremiah 31, 16 and see if I can find comfort in that word. And uh, I don't know offhand what it was, but I remember reading it. It was really good. 31, 16. And the Lord said, Restrain your voice from weeping. Mrs. Joslyn is weeping. Help, oh God. And Mary Ronson says, Joslyn, don't weep. Look what Jeremiah 31 says. 31 says, Restrain from weeping. Keep your eyes from tears. For your work, Mrs. Joslyn, your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of your enemy. No, you're going to get out of this, Mrs. Joslyn. Hang in there. <coughs> Excuse me. And you know what? Mrs. Joslyn, the very next morning, she began to cry, moan, weep, and groan. She was so miserable. The Indians couldn't stand her griping, moaning, groaning, complaining. They took her and her child that was in her lap. They surrounded her and they killed her. They tomahawked her and the baby to death. 
and it so grieved Mary Rawlinson that Mary's faith was so strong. She said she never cried except for one time in their captivity. She always kept her, her strength. I thought that was very fascinating too because Darlene Rose said in front of the Japanese captives, she never cried. She kept her faith that she said she would go back to her cell and she would bawl like a baby because God knows the heart. But she didn't want to buckle under. You see, the Indians didn't like people to act like they were weak because they would kill you very quickly. They almost honored you when you were very valiant and very brave, and they felt that was a great honor. So Mary knows possibly that, and she's keeping her cool as much as possible. She now removes to her fifth removal, and I'm going to make the story shorter. She removes so many times, and there's so little food, and she says it's even a miracle that these Indians could survive out in the wilderness. You're talking about many Indians, as much as 50. Sometimes Indians would come from another band, and you would have 200 Indians out there, and there's no McDonald's, Burger King, or Albertson markets to go buy stuff. you got the wilderness. You know what you eat? You will be shocked. She tells us what they ate. And I memorized a good portion of it. They took ground nuts, like I was chopping at the very beginning of the segment. And when they went to the settlements, they would take the Indians' corn, burn the village, and steal the corn in the field. And they would devour the corn. They would eat their pigs, eat their cows, eat their chicken, eat the food. And they would eat it so quick. Sometimes they would eat it like in one or two days. I mean, they're famished. When it was feast or famine. When they had famine, they were still hungry. What do they eat? lily roots, artichoke roots, bark. They took groundnuts. She said her major food for her captivity time was groundnuts, and this is the kind of nut they had. They had acorns, and they would take these bowls, and they would smash up these things and make patty, mix them with water, and boil them with water, and she would eat acorns. It's incredible, the stuff. I had no idea you could eat half of the stuff that she listed. Some of it is gross. One time, they came upon these bones of a carcass of an animal, and they, they took these this bones and they uh, 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 broke with their tomahawk, they broke the ends of the bone, and then they knew by doing that that there would be critters in there, and they began to boil the other end of the bone, and out coming out of this broken area that they had chopped off, it's, I'm sorry I have to be so descriptive, but you'll have to see the provision, believe it or not, of the Lord. Our maggots are coming out that were in the marrow of the bone. They took that maggots and they began to grind up the maggots, mix them with some acorns, boiled them, and she said that was what she had to eat. She said it was, uh, she said it was what sustained her in the wilderness. Of course, they ate bear, skunk rattlesnake. They ate all those crit critters that you see in, in, your, uh, in the forest and what you're used to seeing in your neighborhood. All those birds you see, they ate birds, whatever they could get their hands on. Uh, and so it was terrible. And she realized the hand of God, so she was starved. You can imagine the weight that Mary Rawlinson had lost. They began to move high and low. The, the Lord gave her several scriptures. Now here I'm going to go into a personal part. And I know I've got to wrap this story up because it's going to be too long and I want you to read it on your own. Her daughter uh, is killed, Sarah. She's got another daughter who's about 10 years old. Her name is Mary, and Mary was taken captive. She doesn't know where Mary is. She's got a son who's about 14. He's taken captive. She doesn't know where they went. They ended up being scattered among those tribes, that, that, those Indians. And what happened is uh, at one point where she is so depressed and so low, what happened is they threw her out of the wigwam one time because they didn't want her around. It was so cold. They didn't want her occupying food and space. So they sent her out there, and she's so lamentable. She's so woeful. She's just had her daughter buried, and she doesn't even know where the Indians buried her. And, and she's so lamentable that God in his mercy brought her daughter Mary because she saw Mary walk in her presence. She says, Mary, you're alive. And she says, Mama. And they began to run towards each other, but the Indians were so mean, they separated them. He says, you can't talk to her. And so again, her heart is so broken. And they pulled a daughter by her hair and rushed her off to another wigwam. But at least she had the comfort to know her daughter was alive. And she's there weeping, with her in, not Indian seeing, and God in his mercy brings her son. And her son comes up to her in her weeping condition, bowing her head. She's weeping, possibly like this. And her son comes up and says, Mother, and she looks up, and it's her son. And she says, you're alive, Joseph. Praise and give glory to God. To look what the Lord has done. And then her and Joseph turned to God's word, and it says they took such comfort in God's word. And the Lord gave them scriptures like, I will return you from captivity. 
the one that Mrs. Jawson had. The Lord gave Joseph all kinds of scriptures right there in front of me. Like one time he opened the Bible, I can just see this tender boy who was in captivity. He says, Mother, look what the Lord has said, that he will not forsake us, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that he has a present help in troubled time. And the Lord led him by the Spirit to turn to those right passages that gave him comfort. Well, he ends up leaving, and uh, he has to go to his master, and uh, they split up again. So over a period of 11 months, Mary goes through the most incredible travail that you can imagine. The food, no children. One time she says, where's my husband? An Indian came up and says, he's been killed. First one Indian came up and says, well, he's, he's married another woman. He doesn't even want you anymore. He found that you're a captive and you belong to us, so he left you and went on and married another woman which was an absolute lie. And she could tell by her spirit that that Indian was lying to her. And she kept her faith. She says, Lord, I know my husband will not marry. He will wait for me. He will buy me back. He will redeem me and my children, was her hope. And then another time, she asked, well, how's my husband? And the Indian says, well, your husband's dead. He was knocked on the head. Again, they were so treacherous and cruel, they ate him alive as he was dying slowly. And then they boiled him up and ate him. They cooked him. And that's what the idiots oftentimes would do with their captives. So this was not far-fetched, but she said, this must be a lie, and she didn't listen to that lie. So she has to endure things like this. They told her that her son and daughter had been killed, but she knew better because one time she came and she asked her master if she could go look for her son as they were camping out, and her master gave her permission. She went and she saw her son laying down on his belly. I, I would demonstrate if I had time, but they just picture me laying down on my belly with his hands like this, and she thought he was sleeping. And so she whispered, she says, Joseph, are you sleeping? And, and Joseph said, no, mother. He looked up, he says, I'm not sleeping. He kind of looked around to make sure there wasn't any Indians looking. She said, listen to this testimony. Mother, I'm praying, but I'm afraid if I pray sitting up as I have before, they're going to come and hit me. So what I do is I lay down when I want to pray, and, and I lay on my stomach. And I pretend like I'm sleeping so I can pray to the Lord. And he, he will protect us, Mother. He has promised me if I pray and seek his face, he will deliver. And the mother looks at her son. And they both have tears in their eyes. And forgive me, I get kind of choked up when I tell this story because it's so meaningful to me. Um, she said, she, uh, she said uh, Joseph, never forget these years of captivity. And when God brings us back, I don't want you to get complacent and forget where you've come from. Always remember that the Lord is faithful. And then her ma the Joseph's master came, because I'm kind of narrating the story. Joseph's master came one time and grabbed him by the head and hair and pulled him away from the mother and said, you're trying to sneak off. Of course, I'm Indian, broken in English. And uh, he said, no, I wasn't. I was just trying to talk to my mother. He says, too bad. And so that was the end. That's the last the mother ever saw. And she found out later that that Indian came and sold him to another Indian because she didn't, this Indian master didn't want him, sold him to the Indian. But Joseph said that was a blessing in disguise because from that time on, he was treated with love, respect by the other Indian and wasn't cruelly treated like some of those Indians would do to their captives. Well, eventually, Mary Rawlinson is brought back from captivity. She sold for 20 pounds. It's a whole miracle in itself how that happens. She's taken back from captivity. I don't want to tell you everything because I want you to really to read the story to your children. It is really a faith builder. But you know what I want to do? I want to close with a section. Remember I've been reading stories to you and I, I write from this book. I narrated most of it, but I want to just tell you how she ends this captivity. Uh, her 20th and her last removal what does she learn from this? Well, I'll just do it briefly. I'd like to read the whole last part, but I won't. All oh, that we could believe, there is nothing too hard from God, for God. He shows his mercy and power over the heathen in this. Even though we were hungry and we were like Daniel in the lion's den, the Lord sustained us. She uses scriptures through the entire narrative. She had she associates herself. She said in one point, I'm like Joseph in Egypt. I've been sold into captivity. And like Joseph said, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I mean, it's so hard to believe. You think you would say, God, why would you do this to me? I'm a righteous saint. You know what she says? Oh, Lord, forgive me. We are sinners. 
We must have done something as an English people to get too cocky, to get too self-confident. Lord, we have not even honored your Sabbaths. We go to church as routine, but our hearts are so far removed from you, she said. She said, would that England would learn that God is faithful to those that are faithful if their hearts are pure and they don't get into quote, religion without a relationship. She said, God indeed has brought this to us to humble his people, to seek his face, and to cry out in the land as the land is being scourged. And almost like God did that to the Israelites. He brought heathens or foreign nations to bring them into judgment. Why? To bring them to repentance, to bring them back from captivity. And that's what she saw. What a testimony. I mean, this woman has a faith that is so sound. Would to God we have that faith in our nation. God many times left us most in darkness where we didn't hear his voice. We didn't know what he was doing. But he, he says, in the time of darkness, deliverance is is the nearest. Yea, leaving my children behind. She was taken and bought, and she said, what would ever come of my children? She realized that God would be faithful to her children. She goes on to describe the food that I did there, and she goes on to explain the, how she was among the midst of royal line. She says, and all the time that she was captive, 11 weeks, five days, she was never violated by those Indians. She said there were times she slept in the same wigwam, and they never touched her person. She said that was a hand of protection because she heard stories where that didn't happen. And she was godly. And she knew God would watch over her. And so she gives testimony to the Lord in that. She quotes Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks. Psalm 107, 12. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. She ends up going to Boston, ends up being, uh, uh, meets her husband, and she ends up giving her last and final charge, a, a beautiful, uh, you might say, benediction in closing. And it's a warning and a lesson for us. Excuse me. I can remember the times when I used to sleep quietly. She's now back from captivity. She now has her children. She's now back in, in, uh, with Christians and she's reminiscing. I can remember the times when I, I used to sleep quietly I, without waking in my thoughts. Whole nights I would sleep, but now at last when all are sleeping, my husband and my two children, and the house is quiet, I wake up and I lay in my bed and I think of the awful things that I went through. I think of how the Lord has been so faithful. I think of His power and His might in carrying us through. I remember in those night seasons and in those dark times, I remember how at the point of death God was so faithful and how he would always bring us provision. We were fed. And now I remember in those former times before captivity where we were fed with the finest wheat. We had the finest things, but we lost those things. We discovered that the things of this earth are so temporal. I watered all these things as I reminisced of my past. In Psalm 6, 5, she quotes, I watered them with my tears. All oh, the wonder and power of God I have seen with my eyes, affording matter enough for my thoughts to run. He says, I have been in extreme vanity in this world. In one hour I had health, wealth, and prosperity, and in the next hour sickness, wounds, and nothing but death and sorrow and affliction. She said, all is vanity vanity of vanities and vexation of spirit. Before I knew what affliction was, I was ready at some time to want it. She's, there was times I thought, well, wow, I got so much. I don't even know what, what it is to be without uh, things. And she said, I almost wanted this. And she says, now I wish I had never said that because after, after having these things taken away from me and gone through such terrible things, she said, it's awful. I don't want those things. But she, she, she realized the temporal things that are on this earth. She said, they just flee. They're but a vapor. She says, there are things that are outward that are nothing but vanity and vexation of spirit. It is but a, like a shadow, a bubble that blasts. It just pops, a popping bubble. That we must remember to rely on God himself. And our whole dependence must be upon him if trouble for small matters begin to rise in me. And those, if I get shaken up and I see things happening like we tend to do in our life, oh God, I can't make the mortgage payment. Oh Lord, the car broke down. She says, when things rise up in me, I always remember where I came from, what I went through. I check myself and get a control of myself and I realize what little trouble I'm in. It was but the other day that I had the world and I'd give anything for my freedom. 
I have learned to look beyond present small troubles and to be quieted under them and say as Moses does in Exodus 14, 13, be still and know that I am the Lord. I'd like to close with one last very important but brief concept that I think is so valuable. What Mary Rawlinson's story tells me that I'd like to share with you is that who knows the destiny of our nation? How strong are we as Christians? What can we endure? What kind of tribulation, persecution can we have? And what are we teaching our children to endure? It's not a very pleasant subject. We don't want to sit down to our children and say, children, let's talk about persecution. Let's talk about imprisonment. But I believe it's such an important thing to speak about. I believe America, and I don't know if this is prophetic. I, I, I would pray it's not. I believe America is heading in a dangerous course. Any nation that has risen to the power that we have had with God as our source and then throw him out is a nation that is dangerously heading for collision. Who would have thought 20 years ago, back in the 1950s and, and uh, early 40s, 50s, and, and very early 60s, that a person who tries to save the life of an unborn child would be put uh, in a prison. And many yet today, men and women have uh, undergone the humiliation just because of trying to uh, educate uh, women with alternative views to save that child, to put the child up for adoption, are jailed. And yet on the same hand, uh, we have a nation today where uh, homosexuals can gum, come to churches and break up church services and uh, cause havoc, and yet the society is afraid to touch them. It's almost as if in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah where they, the ungodly rise up against those righteous ones and cause uh, uh, danger, damage, and hurt. And yet, I believe we must train ourselves not to become complacent, but to become sharp, vigilant, ever watching, preparing ourselves and our children, giving them and strengthening their faith that no matter what happens, their testimony will be for Jesus Christ, that they will resist the evil as much as possible, be conscientious to fight for the rights of our nation based on the Founding Fathers' godly concepts and principles. And at the same time, build their faith that if they are losing those rights and they're being gradually whittled away, that they will resist that and they will remain firm, that their faith will not be denied because of a moment's pleasure and things that are taken away, that we could say as Mary that, that we should be still and know that God is the Lord and that no matter what happens, God is faithful to those that are faithful to Him. That's the story that I want to leave you with this, this uh, teaching that we've had at this session. And I'd like to close and ask a benediction upon you. Father in heaven, that those that would hear and, and listen to this story, that you would bless them. Would you watch over them, guard them, keep them whole and healthy, strengthen those young children. Uh, not, Lord, that we should scare our children, but that we should build their faith, that they would say that I am willing to trust in the Lord and know and be still that he is faithful to me no matter what happens outwardly that I will be as Joseph and I will know that, uh, that, that God meant this for good. Father, I thank you for this testimony of Mary Rawlinson. Would you bless it in Jesus' name, amen.